Good morning and welcome to this virtual bridge session and it's uh, starting off the academic uh, year 21-22 indeed and yesterday I was at a JISC event dealing with diversity and inclusion and that's a very big area and today's presentation is related to that however it's focused on that pivot to online that many of us have been through over the past year and learning from the experiences the diverse experiences of many in that. We're very pleased to welcome from Age Scotland uh, both Mike Douglas and Jonathan Park, who are going to talk about delivering age inclusion workshops virtually. And with that, over to you. Thank you, Jason. I'll just come in and share my screen and hopefully it will be us up and running. Looking good. Excellent. <laughs> well, thank you very much, everyone. Uh, thank you for giving us the, the platform today to share some of the work that we do across Scotland on age inclusion, um, and specifically to talk about the last sort of 12, 18 months and the journey to digital um, that we've been making. So, you know, why do we focus on age inclusion in the workplace? Well, you know, we know that there are uh, a whole series of protected characteristics um, defined by the Equality Act. But in reality, when we speak to organizations, we find that age really is the poor relation in the DNI agenda. Most companies uh, will have some sort of DNI program focusing on gender, on race, and on sexual orientation but actually very few have done anything about age, yet it's the one protected characteristic that will affect us all. And when we look at older workers themselves, 30% of them didn't even know that it was illegal for employers to discriminate against them on the basis of their age. So I then started to think about, how can I really bring this to life for you to make you realize that this is a really big issue? So what I did was I went to the supermarket and in the supermarket, I bought three cards, genuine birthday cards that you can go and buy at your local supermarket. What I couldn't find was anything that said, ha ha, you're disabled. I couldn't find anything mocking people of color because that would be clearly unacceptable. But actually, as we currently stand, age seems to be fair game. So how do we work with employers to help them create an age-inclusive workplace? Well, for us, this started in 2014, where we started to sow the seeds um, <coughs> of our, our now orchard, uh, where we launched retirement planning workshops. And these were full day workshops, um, not just doing the traditional, let me tell you about your pension, and how much money you're going to have, but looking at how you're going to live, how you're going to look after your health and well-being, what you're going to do with your time and create an active social life what the legal aspects of later life are and how you need to look after your legal issues as well. Over the years, that has developed. And in 2020, we have a significant health and well-being program aimed at the health and well-being of older workers because health and well-being between 50 and 70 is very different than health and well-being between 30 and 50. And very few organizations have done anything in that space. And we've also done a lot of work in age inclusion, helping managers deal with five different generations in the workplace and looking at uh, immersive unconscious bias by immersing people in their own biases. And I'm going to give you a little feel for that later on. So that was us up until 2020. Up until then, we'd run over 300 workshops. We'd had nearly 7,000 attendees. We'd worked with 220 Scottish organizations and 98% of attendees at our workshops would recommend that workshop to a colleague. So all's going swimmingly well. Then by complete coincidence, two days before uh, lockdown was announced, uh, we had Nicola Sturgeon in our offices um, and she obviously knew a lot more than we did as to what was happening. Um, and at that point, the Scottish government asked us to run the national helpline for older people 
through the lockdown period, we went from having eight people um, in a contact centre based in the office right behind Nicola there, to having every single member of staff, uh, over 50 members of staff, working from home on a soft phone system through their laptops, handling thousands of calls from older people across Scotland. And, you know, the calls during that period really went from uh, people terrified they couldn't get medicine, uh, the ba local banks had run out of cash, so they couldn't get cash out to buy food, they couldn't get anyone to, to go and get food for them because they were shielding. And as it went on, the calls moved more into loneliness and isolation and all the issues around that. So how did that affect our training enterprise? <laughs> well, from being here in 2020, we now have virtual workshops available right across the product suite with the exception of the functional fitness MOT. And the functional fitness MOT is where one of our physiotherapists works with individuals to do genuinely do a physical MOT so that they can understand where they are strong and where they're not so strong. And obviously that has to be done face to face. So, but apart from that, whether it's the dementia awareness, the health and well-being courses, right through to unconscious bias, we're delivering these successfully virtually. So how was that journey? And I think this is a great picture of the early days of trying to run workshops remotely. Um, we, I guess when you think about it, where video conferencing was used previously, people would be in offices. And so you would be doing pretty much an office to office uh, connection. But as you can see here, when everyone starts logging on from home, we experience that people have just vastly different levels of IT experience, vastly different uh, qualities of IT hardware, um, and possibly most important, vastly different levels of uh, broadband speeds. And I think uh, over the, the last year, a large number of people have invested in improved broadband speeds so that they can work from home. Um, and that, that caused a lot of challenges earlier on. So when we come into actually looking at the workshops that we run, <coughs> we actually got heavily involved in Zoom um, although our preferred platform would have been Teams but for, from a security perspective. But Zoom had significant levels of functionality that we really found we needed to use in order to keep the workshops engaging and stimulating. So uh, breakout rooms was very important. And, and, and obviously Teams now does do breakout rooms. but the breakout rooms were very important because the whole point of doing a workshop is that people get a chance to talk to each other, learn from each other, share experiences. And when you've got 16 people on one big screen, that's less easy to do. Breaking them out into groups of four was giving people, people responded much better, they got more engaged, and, and they, were, they certainly found it a more enjoyable and rewarding experience. So breakout rooms was an essential piece. I mean, obviously it, it's something we would do as a matter of course nowadays, but in those early days, it was very new. The other aspect was using polls. So quite often, if you're doing a face-to-face -face workshop, you would say, you know, who's done this, who's done that, put your hand up if, keep people moving around. <clears throat> Where obviously we do that electronically through the use of polls. And actually even today, um, Microsoft's functionality on polls is not as simple and easy to use as it is on Zoom. And for that reason, quite a few of our trainers still prefer to use Zoom um, for that reason. So by using polls, it's quite effective because you can ask a question you, and then the results display graphically in front of people and everyone can see the opinion of the room. It's a good way to keep people engaged and, and to stimulate conversation and learning. And it's also quite good because it adds a visual element. So you're not just talking all the time. We also discovered that <coughs> the sessions um, 
on virtual workshops needed to be shorter than on face-to-face -face workshops. Um, so things like our planning for your future, which is ordinarily a full day face-to-face, -face, um, we run over two half days when we do it virtually. Um, quite a few of the workshops, like Unconscious Bias and things like that, um, the immersive nature of it actually takes an hour longer to do face-to-face. -face. When you do it virtually, um, it is much shorter. There's a bit less debate going around in the room. Um, and so that was a bit of a learning that you, those need, needed to be shorter. And I think one of the other big things for us was having technical support. So on all of our workshops, there is a presenter who is hosting the workshop but there is also a technical support person on every workshop because keeping people engaged virtually, making sure you're modulating the vo your tone of voice um, and using uh, more uh, interesting slides, you need to be able to focus on that. And anyone who is having trouble getting logged in, et cetera, et cetera, the technical support person deals with that. Uh, they also deal with all the polls, making sure that they get activated at the right time and that the results get displayed so that if anything goes wrong there as well, they're there to do that. So interestingly, while we, on a face-to-face -face workshop, we may have one presenter there. When we run it virtually, we have two. We also provided our uh, all of our presenters with voice coach training because we found that it was very important when you're, you know, some people are more animated physically, they'd walk around the room a lot, but maybe their voices weren't um, as uh, interesting to listen to. So we made sure that they all went through voice coach training. So that, because it's really the only tool that you've got when you're working virtually. So lots of practical learning points on the ground. We also then started to invest in digital assets um, that could stimulate some of the conversations that would go around the room. Um, and what I'm going to do now is, is show you a couple of the interactive elements that we do. So this is a, a film short from a couple of minutes um, on what, what is age inclusion? Is it actually an issue in the workplace? The UK's Equality Act 2010 identifies nine areas where employees are protected by law from discrimination. Ageism is any form of negative or positive discrimination, stereotype or bias relating to age. The Scottish Government's Fair Work Convention has a vision that by 2025, people in Scotland will have a world-leading working life, where fair work drives success, well-being and prosperity. A third of Scottish workers are 50 or older. Older, younger. Ageism affects us all. More than a third of over 45s believe that ageism is a problem in their workplace. Including being a barrier to progression and development. Eighty-two percent of 55 to 64 year olds see their age as a disadvantage when applying for a job. 16% of 25 to 34 year olds feel the same. So how do we create age inclusive workplaces where employees of all ages feel respected, valued and are able to fulfill their aspirations and potential? So hopefully that gives you a feel um, for how 
putting digital content into your presentations takes away from always just having one person making the point and leading the workshop. Uh, you'll also see that's the reason for having technical support people there, because when I went to try and check the chat, I didn't realize it was actually going to pause the video. So now I'm going to take a look at um, some other filming that we did um, for our unconscious bias workshops. Now, unconscious bias uh, is a very interesting subject that a lot of people have done a lot of work on. Um, the reason we got involved in it was the only unconscious bias programs I can find talk about gender, race, and sexual orientation, and that's it. And age didn't fe uh, feature at all. And there was also no intersectionality involved in the, workshop, uh, in the workshops I had seen. Um, and my other concern about them was they were a little bit of a lecture. So someone would stand up and say, this is unconscious bias. It's really not a good thing to do. You should really stop. You think, okay, that's interesting. Um, how do I do that? So what we did was we created some different digital assets that would help people experience their own biases uh, and understand how their own biases impact others. So I'm going to show you a short film here of about one minute. Um, it, it's filmed of somebody walking into our office. There's no sound, and you're going to see the same shot four times. But I think as you look at it, you will feel very differently each time. And yet nobody has said a word to you. So this game is called, Who Am I? So there you see very, very different, react different ways that somebody makes you feel just by the way that you actually look at them. And so this is just a small part of the, the digital elements that we use in, in a workshop. But it's quite interesting, you know, who, who, who was the person in each of those sessions? A woman in a hijab? A mum with a big buggy and noisy children? someone from beg, been begging on the streets outside, someone in a wheelchair. What happens if it was the same person each time and that these people were just in different moods that day? So these digital assets work really well when we're doing virtual workshops because they can be used to stimulate really good conversation. And the next exciting thing that we're doing, and actually we're doing this at 12 o'clock today, so we are genuinely excited about this today, is we are looking to build virtual reality experiences to help people understand and empathize what it's like to be living with dementia. Um, and we're looking at the proof of concept today. So look out for new workshops from us, hopefully in about three to six months time. So I think our summary of the situation would be, we think virtual is here to stay, but we don't think it'll be exclusively virtual. We do have some organizations who have got staff spread all around the country who are saying, we love this virtual because you know, people from all around the country, we just could never afford to get them together. We couldn't afford the travel time, the travel costs 
to actually get people into the same room, the overnight accommodation. And so it has been very, uh, from some organisations, has been hugely encouraging and they see this as, as the long term. However, we have a few organisations that are saying, look, we're going to suspend this till we can get people back face to face around a room, sharing experiences with each other. But if you remember before I said pre-pandemic, 98% of attendees at workshops would recommend it to a colleague. We've run 100 sessions since September last year, and 99% of attendees would recommend it to a colleague. So virtual does work for people. I, I, I certainly appreciate um, it can be non-inclusive for people who are less comfortable using digital assets and and for that reason um and if just for personal preference we do see face to face coming back once it's safe to do so but for us it's been a really successful trend it's allowed us to keep working with organizations on becoming age inclusive uh, despite us going through what we've done in the last 18 months and that's us. And thank you very much for that uh, thought provoking uh, review of your move to online. And we've had in a, a good few comments there. And I'll start off at the top with Walter's. Uh, who, uh, and I'll just repeat the comment, if you don't mind, Walter, about uh, the fact that the Zoom gallery show uh, shot that you uh, you had up there uh, showed very much the differences. And uh, he says about the hardware and about the bandwidth. I would also add to that, and again, Walter, I'm sure you're uh, one with this. Um, it also shows about the difference in conducive environment that people have to be able to, be able to take part as well. And, uh, and that can be difficult. Um, and I think there was uh, certainly uh, the appreciation of the voice coach training, the recognition of the importance of voice, not something we've had before. Can I ask if um, there's anything that you did in the, the move online that you, thinking back, would have done earlier? Yeah, thinking back, that would have done earlier. I don't know, Jonathan, what do you think as well? Um, I think I would have got this background done earlier. That's for sure. A good background. Um, yeah, it's been it's been very good. I actually started lockdown, doing a different photo from my personal photo archive from around the world every day, and then after a month, I thought, "Hang on a minute, oh, let's do this every week." And then if it carries on like this, I'll maybe just change it once a month. Um, but yeah, I, th I think I think that's an issue. I think. Um, I think you made a really good point that I, I omitted to mention is people's personal um, space. And, you know, there's definitely been an age element to this that's starting to come through really strongly in research. A lot of older workers are saying, yeah, I'm further on in my career. I've got a nicer house. I've got plenty of space at home. Why would I want to go back to the office again? Uh, and a lot of youngsters are going, well, apart from the fact I'm not seeing any of my friends and building careers and learning from people, there are four of us in this flat on one living room table and you can't have four Zoom meetings at the same time. It just doesn't work. So th there's definitely been that element. I think that's a really good point that you made. I think... Um, I think the tech support one was thinking about it quite obvious, but the first two or three workshops that we ran, we just ran them with one presenter. And I think you really, you really need to think about how are you, how are you getting through to people? What's the learning experience like? Um, and and we we have had two or three presenters say, "Look, this just isn't for me. I'm happy." to do more once we're back face to face again. Um, and we probably underestimated the impact on the presenters. Um, and so that 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 is something, I, I guess like all things, isn't it? If you're quite comfortable with technology, you, you sort of naturally assume everyone else will get it once they've tried it a couple of times. And it doesn't always work that way. Yeah, um, it's, it's very easy to make assumptions. I think you know that that whoever you bring to present or you know morph them into online environments will just cope. But we we that that, that was something we probably should have jumped on sooner to to offer more support of all different kinds to our, our vast array of speakers that we have. Because mm -hmm. yeah, as, as Mike said, some some people just just turned it back and said, "Sorry, I'll I'll wait till till." 
face to face because that's that's not just for me, and we, we should have picked on up on that a bit sooner. Yeah. And I've got two questions here, and I'll invite the people to come in and, and do them. First of all, it will be Kenji and then Lorraine. Kenji, would you like to ask your question there? Yeah, yeah. I'm just interested. You, you mentioned that you had to compress some of the courses, make them shorter if they were delivered online. And, and do you feel that something was missed? I mean, given that your satisfaction rates actually went up, but if yeah. you compress the course, what, yeah, what do so you miss out on? Yeah, so what well, I think what happens is when when you're doing face to face, you'll sit there and you'll say, um, "Okay, let, let's take unconscious bias. Let's talk about all port scale." So all port scale goes from just you know walking across the other side of the street, of sort of when when a, a person of race comes along, or, uh, and it ends up with um, Holocaust type mass hysteria around the country if i'm doing that face to face i can spend five to minutes putting it up and then we can have a chat about it and the chat will go on and we, that could take half an hour while we all explore it but when you do it, it virtually it still takes you the five ten minutes to go through it but the chat doesn't go on for 20 minutes people tend to go yeah i got that i saw that I said this, you said that, and the chat only goes on for another five or 10 minutes. And so that's where the compression, so we didn't really take any content out, but we just found, you know, we've got a workshop on dementia awareness uh, in the workplace that face-to-face -face, people are sitting around and they're chatting, oh yeah, yeah, yeah I never thought about it. I mean, my granddad's starting to display that signs of that. I never thought that that could be the start of, and all these conversations go around. Whereas face-to-face -face, that just, doesn't take as long. It just doesn't go on as long, and so that yeah. that, that was why they were compressed. Yeah, I, I think a, a lot of people might have a sort of a webinar mindset when they do some sort of anything online, and, and they, they don't assume that participation is sort of you know requested. Yeah, and there's some some people shy away from from participating online for some reason. Whereas if they were in a room all together, they'd be participating fine. Yeah. So that's, that's the mindset. Are, it is in the early days, you know, so if we had a three hour face to face workshop, the presenters are going, I really struggled to make that last three hours. And we're like, all oh, right, all oh, right. Yeah. And then, you know, a week later, we're thinking, so just make it two. If the content is two hours of online, why are we trying to make it three just because it took three face to face? So I think you have to realize that they're very different. And um, also, the actual administration tasks, if you're running things like this, when you do it virtually, you need a lot more central admin because if you think about it, if you're going to deliver a workshop face to face, you know, the organization book the workshop, that's all done. You send them an invoice and then the presenter turns up on the day and does the presentation. But when it's virtual, we've got to get from the person who booked it, we've got to get all 16 people's email addresses. We've got to send out joining instructions. We've got to book Zoom meetings. We've got to get all of that administered in a GDPR compliant manner so that we're not hanging on to people's personal email addresses and things like that. So actually the amount of back office admin to run it virtually is probably four or five times a face-to-face -face one. Uh, so, and we certainly had to bring in extra administrator to the team that we hadn't really thought of, you know, well, hang on, why are the team struggling? And it was only, we were so focused on the presentations, we forgot about the back office piece. So that, it would have been great if we'd thought about that in advance. Thank you very much. We've got time for one quick question. And um, Lorraine, if you don't mind me paraphrasing, she's asked about whether there's been any sign of move from, well, novelty at the start to then um, perhaps a little bit more comfortable to it, but then getting a bit tired of the online thing through time. Have you perceived any movement and attitudes? I think for internal communications and internal meetings, yes. You know, I think people are, oh, another meeting about this, you know, we've not already said that. Um, people's sort of tolerance for that has dropped. But I think when you're doing external training, you're bringing in a new subject. I think it's actually quite welcomed because, you know, this isn't another meeting about the such and such product or whatever we're doing. It's like, hang on, this is something completely different. I'm quite keen to do this because it, it, it's just different to, to the normal. So I don't think we've found, I think the feedback scores, you know, at 99% show that actually people are welcoming the opportunity to still learn something new when actually there's not that much new happening in their lives. 
but I suppose there might be a difference between them. It's still very highly recommending it, but um, as uh, by preference, they would actually rather go back to the the face to face. So you might get a hundred percent recommendation, yes. of course, in face to face. Yes, I think that's absolutely correct, and and we we don't keep attendees contact details so we can't actually go back and say actually with hindsight would you have preferred which would have been an interesting thing to do but you know not a reason to hang on to thousands of personal email addresses so. well thank you very much uh, this brings us to the end of the recorded piece uh, mike and uh, jonathan thank you very much and for the insight into age scotland and your move online which has clearly had uh, a great deal of success 99 percent uh, recommendation something to be proud of thank you very much Thank you. Thanks.